Barbara and Nancy O'Hara for um, in, inviting me to, to come. This is really a delight for me to um, make a trip uh, to Sydney. I haven't been here since 2000, just a little bit before the, the Olympics, so this was really a treat. Um, I'm uh, um, humbled by the, 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 uh, the introduction. It's important to remember that um, there were a lot of other people that helped in, in founding, you know, the, mito the journal Mitochondria and the Mitochondrial Medicine Society. You know, so so I was just one of the early architects, and um, there, it, it took a team. And that's actually a message that I'll be talking about today: is that this is really all about um, communication between parts of a, a whole. So I didn't get training on how to actually use this. So let's see. OK, so that's that. Is there a, OK, I know that there is a, OK, I can't get the, the laser to work, but um, we'll No laser for now. We'll work without it. It's it's fine. So, um, okay. So so I'm going to talk to you about the cell danger response um, and healing and chronic illness. Um, it's a conflict of interest uh, page where I'll give this a shot here. Oh, okay. Good. Um, so I'm on the scientific advisory board for the ARI, Open Medicine, and MitoQuest, and, and uh, it's important to note that the drug that I'll talk about today is um, a 100-year-old drug called Suramin, but there are no approved usages um, in the United States, um, uh, you know, and it's illegal to import and use in humans um, uh, without uh, Food and Drug Administration approval and uh, um, an IRB approval. So the outline of the talk today is going to be on, uh, so I'll first talk about the healing cycle, the, the cell danger response. I'll talk about this critical difference between acute versus chronic illness, and that breaks down to a difference in approaching treatment that has to do with engineering solutions and biological solutions. Talk a little bit about mitochondria, metabolomics, purinergic signaling, and then um, wrap up with the, the results of our first uh, sermon um, autism treatment trial, SAT1. So the cell danger response is a universal response to any and all uh, environmental injury and stress. So um, whether that, that stress, so I'll just point out, so we start off in health and there are literally thousands of ways we can be injured in the environment. We can scrape our knee, cut our fingers. Um, we can be born with um, eco alleles of particular genes that alter our ability, um, our genomic resilience to um, environmental stress, our ability to methylate or to um, signal between cells. Um, and all of those different ways are paths that lead to this chronic state of injury. And so, so genes, pollution, infections, pesticides, heavy metals, you know, hundreds and hundreds of more. Um, but it turns out that in order to heal, we actually have to, to proceed through a biologically a determined ontogenetic sequence. Okay, this is something we inherited from our ancestors. That's all life on the planet actually has to heal in a similar way. Um, moving from beginning to, to middle to end, and I call these the cell danger response one, two, and three stages. It turns out there are quality, quality control checkpoints um, that 
influence the progress of healing through each of the different steps. And that many different metabolites, including extracellular nucleotides like ATP, have a different function outside the cell than they have inside the cell. And they actually participate as quality control molecules that help the, the tissues and the cells know how, what step of healing um, they are in. Okay, and so antipurinergic therapy, pur purines have to, you know, relate to ATP and pyrimidines are the um, pyrimidine nucleotides like CTP and UTP. Um, all of those play a role that's different outside the cell than inside the cell. So this is an absolutely fundamental concept. You can, we will not be successful as a community until physicians around the world know this know the difference, that the path that leads you to disease is not the path that leads you back to health, okay? It's the path, so that the path that leads you to disease, we can provide symptomatic relief for, and that can be absolutely life-saving at times, but it will not activate the pathways of healing, <laughs> okay? All right, so to say this in a different way, a lot of what I do in, in science is stumble around kind of like a, a, a child's game where you um, put on a blindfold, um, turn around, and take a step in one direction. That step is, a, is an experiment that we do where we're asking a question of nature. Okay? And nature will say hotter or colder. Okay? And if we get the answer we're moving in the right direction. Then we take another step in that direction. This pathway is guaranteed to result in discoveries in medicine and science because it is tapping in to the, the, the source of all information that, is, that energizes and maintains life on our planet and throughout the universe. Okay, so we've spent a lot of time in this field of pathogenesis. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about etymology because it'll be important for later. So pathos is Greek for suffering or illness or abnormality, okay? There are literally thousands of agents. And we can direct drugs to specific pathogenetic processes, okay? But those do not help with facilitating progress through the healing cycle. They just can help to prevent re-injury, okay, and stress. Um, so in order to, when you're an explorer and you're studying something new, many times, we find that we do not have the words to describe what we see, okay? Okay, these are just facts on the ground. They're observations that are being made of a new land that we've discovered because we've landed in a territory nobody else has been in before, okay? It turns out in, in, um, in the process of healing or returning from chronic illness to health, there's a beginning, a middle, Let's see if I can do this, okay, go forward. A beginning, a middle, and an end, and they're, they're all supported by the, the, the specialized mitochondrial activity of mitochondria, the so-called M1 mitochondria in the beginning, M0 mitochondria in the middle, and M2 mitochondria in the, in, in the end, and I'll just rapidly say M1, its job is to produce reactive oxygen. It's not a stress. It's the job of M1 mitochondria, okay? In order to get to the next step, you actually have to dial that back down. So it is abnormal for that to persist, but it's absolutely normal for it to be present in the beginning. So in order to go to the M0 stage, which is a um, stage of mitochondria needed for uh, replacement of cells that have been lost in, a, in, in the original injury, 
Okay? Those have to have a, a different kind of metabolism um, specialized for growing cells, a call, called a Warburg metabolism. And then N M2 mitochondria at the end of this process are mitochondria that are helping the cell to be educated by surrounding neighboring cells to become a good citizen of the healed tissue, okay? To become part of the, the, the network that leads to optimum organ function, to, to restoration of health. All right. So the Roman goddess of personal health and well-being was a goddess named Salus. Okay, I, I'm bringing this up because of etymology. Okay. So we talk about pathogenesis as the creation of disease. We need a term that will help us describe this phenomenon of what Leah actually talked about. She talked about it as health forming. Okay. But salogenesis is a new term. I don't know that it'll catch on. Um, but it is, it, instead of looking for pathogens, we'll start looking for salogens things that help bring about the restoration of health through an, a discrete knowledge, an absolute knowledge of the molecular systems biology of this progress of healing through beginning, middle, and end stages. All right. So it turns out, although there can be thousands of different pathogens, um, uh, and you know, before the microscope, we didn't know that bacteria existed, so you couldn't be a microbiologist, okay? Um, and you couldn't, we couldn't know about the importance of the microbiome until we gave it a name, okay? Um, so, so this is one way of of studying the process that generates health, okay? And it's highly conserved evolutionarily. It is a choreographed ontogenetic sequence um, that, that has common bottlenecks, quality control steps, and delay mechanisms that are not unlike kind of sec secondary ecological succession where there's a patch of land in the rainforest that might be burned, and then it ha that patch has to be recovered okay, and reclaimed by the rainforest. So studies of pathogenesis will lead to treatments that produce palliation. Okay? So that, that's like insulin can be used to treat diabetes, but it never cures diabetes. Statins can be used to treat dyslipidemia, but never cure dyslipidemia. Okay? Um, antihistamines can be, can be used to treat allergies, but they never cure an allergy. Okay? I could go on and on and on because it actually is all of traditional medicine. Okay? This is the way that we deal with symptoms is we create engineered, engineering solutions for acute symptoms. Okay? And they can be life-saving when there's an exacerbation of the, those acute symptoms. Okay? So this is not to cast aspersions on, on our toolbox of medicines that we have today. It's a call to begin a search and begin to, to train our pharmaceutical chemists that there is an entirely new class of drugs yet to be discovered, okay, that are salogens, okay? All right, so the use of, you know, so, you know, so, like there's pathophysiology, there's you know, uh, salophysiology, there's, uh, you, know, you can go on and on about this. But anyway, these treatments are designed to lead to recovery. And by recovery, I mean a return to a baseline, baseline state of vibrant health. Okay? Not something that requires taking medicines for life, but just requires good food, exercise, good sleep, and friendship, okay, because we're social animals. All right. Okay, what causes chronic disease? I'll say it's actually the failure to heal. So this is a bizarre tautology that I'll, I'll say. People are sick because they can't get better. 
<laughs> right? I, so, so you break a leg. We put a cast on the leg to support healing. We, after six weeks, we'll take that cast off. The initially atrophic muscles will re-strengthen. And after perhaps another six weeks, the point of break in a leg fracture um, will be stronger than it was at when, before the fracture. Okay? But there's no longer a need to continue with the cast. Okay? So chronic... I'll say I'll make a statement that chronic disease is actively main, is an actively maintained reaction to injury, not like a scab or wound that will not heal. A disease that is, that is left behind, the disease that is left behind, is not the initial injury, and it's very easy to be confused by this. Okay, very easy. Um, so it doesn't do any good to put sunscreen on a melanoma. Okay. Um, it doesn't do any good to wish that your child did not receive as many head traumas playing football or soccer in high school um, that might lead to an increased susceptibility to post-traumatic stress disorder later on from the military. Okay? You have to think about ongoing processes that, that create risk and maintain illness. All right. So what's... Making, why are more people getting sick? Well, the environment is becoming increasingly toxic, and this is something we are spending a lot of time in the lab developing um, advanced technologies to measure our food chain, water, air, and actually um, a variety of different um, biological samples as well to measure existing um, uh, toxic burdens. Why do some people, why do people stay chronically ill? They can't heal, why can't they heal? And I'll say in, in most cases, it's because the healing cycle is blocked, okay? Salogenesis is blocked, okay? Um, but it can also be continuously re-injured. That's another thing. So if you cut your finger and every day you reopen it, okay? It's, it's going to eventually scar and it'll take a lot longer to heal. Okay. All right. For more information, you have a number of articles here. So I'll, I'll point out the first one, the metabolic features and regulation of the healing cycle. Read that one first. Um, these first two, the second one is the metabolic features of the cell danger response. These are the number one and number two most downloaded um, uh, scientific papers in the journal Mitochondrion right now. Number two has been on the, you know, the hit list for the last five years, the top few. Um, uh, and I've just recently, um, there'll be a, a paper tying the cell danger response into aging and, and the, as a result of incomplete healing that will come out in the next month. Okay. I encourage you all to, to take a look at our website, uh, naviolab.ucsd.edu. You can um, look particularly under the projects drop-down menu under the 28th Amendment project. Um, this is a, uh, an effort to try to give all of us the, the, the right to be born into an environment that does not cause chronic illness because what is more important for the health of a nation than the health of its citizens and ultimately its children. All right, so I, I talked about this key difference between acute illness and chronic illness. So in acute illness, we treat the injury. In chronic illness, we try to unblock salogenesis, the healing cycle. So the first book of medicine was written over the past 5,000 years of human history. Okay, this is written history. And since World War II in particular, we've gotten very good. Modern medicine has gotten very good at preventing the things that can kill you fast. Okay? So um, treating uh, gunshot wounds, automobile trauma, um, heart attacks, strokes, um, and uh, asthmatic crisis. Uh, these are things that, that we've gotten better at. Those are all acute injuries, okay? acute processes. And 
Homo sapiens as a species is, is so conditioned to using tools to fix problems. They've, we've, we've, we naturally think that it's our intervention that brings about change, okay? Um, that we forget that there is a deeper knowledge that we can only unveil, we cannot create. Okay. Um, that actually connects us with health of the planet. All right. So acute injury. So I'm calling for a second book of medicine. Hopefully this will be written over the next 10 to 100 years. But, but this is about molecular recovery therapies, okay? the, the search for salogens. Okay, these are things that probably many do exist already in coral reefs, the, the rainforest. Okay, we just have not had an organized way of thinking and searching for these things. All right. Okay, so acute illness treatment is like engineering. It uses external energy analysis and materials. That's important, external energy analysis and materials. Okay. And most doctors are taught this in medicine because of this importance of tools to our species. Okay? So we can intervene and we can prevent acute deaths many times. Okay? But when we, yeah, so each of these is under the direct control of the practitioner. But for chronic illnesses, we need to unveil existing biology. We need to support resilience. We need, to, we, we need to get out of the way of healing. Okay? So it's nothing like engineering. Okay? It uses internal cellular energy, cellular materials, cellular analysis. Okay? Um, and that analysis is written into the DNA code okay? to create this ontogenetic sequence that leads to a beginning, middle, and end of healing. Okay? And unfortunately, none is directly controlled by the doctor, but this is almost like a, a maternal nurture. It's a nurturing, when, in the, the sense of a healer actually helping to support the inner physician in every, every one of your patients, okay? which is the most powerful healer any one of us will ever encounter. Okay? Um, that's what we're trying to do with this new kind of molecular systems analysis of healing. All right, so, so we can define things in a way that helps us understand. Um, so external, so acute injuries are externally a ca caused, um, and you know, we support the ABCs, you know, um, airway, breathing, circulation. Um, we can treat an infection, we can treat a uh, physical injury, try to repair damage surgically from a gunshot wound. Um, but we can define two different kinds of chronic illness. One, a chronic illness that's functional that where there's no structural damage in the tissues yet. Okay. So those are, I call those type two chronic illnesses. And 2A would be the triggers are still present. The triggers that led to the problem are still present. And 2B, those triggers are remote. Those happened a long time ago. That gunshot wound to led to the person's current PTSD healed years ago. Okay. Um, and then type three chronic illnesses are um, those that where there is actually damage and the damage is ongoing. And sometimes it's an accelerated form of damage. So Alzheimer's, for example, is accelerated loss of specific regions of, uh, of the brain, neurons in specific regions of the brain. But that process is ongoing and it's accelerated in, let's say, uh, football players who received a, a number of uh, recurrent head injuries, or boxers. In fact, this is a, a strange story of a circle coming back. My very first publication was a letter to the editor of JAMA um, when I was uh, a, a first year medical student pointing out a reanalysis of some CAT scan data on um, uh, dementia pugilistica. So this is, you know, um, <laughs> dementia associated with um, uh, boxing and showing that 
you know, in my analysis, it was not so much a direct effect as a, it, an accelerated loss of, of, of brain tissue um, using existing pathways, okay, but, but basically an accelerated loss. So it, it gave the hope that there was an intervention that if you, you understood this process was ongoing and accelerated in those individuals, you could actually prevent dementia 20 years later. So incomplete healing and aging. So, all right, first book of medicine, acute illnesses. We start out with health. There's an injury. We treat the ABCs, the symptomatic support. And then this is part of the reason we never developed the word salogenesis, is because healing was so reliable. It was something that we just didn't even have to think about, okay, as physicians. But in fact, it was happening every time we got somebody, somebody over the acute injury and the risk of death. We rely, so we, we treated somebody for pneumonia, okay? Once the, in, the microbial infection was eradicated, we depended on a, a replacement of the damaged pneumocytes, okay? The, the lung cells. We required, and we required remodeling of the tissue so that it wouldn't completely scar, okay? All that was happening secretly in this black box, okay? All right, and, and most of the time it would lead to health. But occasionally we were, were diverted to another path where that black box was not doing what we expected of it. Okay? And it leads to a persistent state of marginal improvement, drug side effects, drug dependence, and disability for life. Okay, so we, we frequently give medicines that, you know, you have to take your whole life. They make you this much better, okay, um, and you feel better because of it, okay, but it comes at a cost, and you're never fully able to become independent of, let's say, insulin or, yeah, well, I won't go into all the other things. So there's a lot of things. So, all right, so second book of medicine, chronic illnesses, we get to the same point. You know, but it turns out now that because we're living in an increasingly toxic world where the chemical composition of our food chain is changing and, you know, a lot of it we don't have a, a lot of control. And it, I'll, I'll say that it's even hard when you, you go, you try to eat organic and eat local. If you, you are measuring the chemical loads of even some organic compound, organically grown foods. They're still the best option, but because they're grown in a world next to fields that are not um, uh, attentive to more um, non-toxic uh, agricultural techniques, they can be contaminated as well, okay? And so my, my message is to go into this eyes open. Okay, this is not about, you know, trying to bury our heads into one particular satisfying um, approach or not. It's to use science to guide us and to make the world a better place. Okay, because we can live with the facts if we know the facts. And we can change the world if we know what we're doing that is harming our children and our elderly. Okay, so if we unpack that black box called the healing cycle and use the tools of molecular systems biology, we can, we can define a health cycle, uh, an early, a beginning, a middle, and an end, CDR1, CDR2, CDR3. And depending on the particular disease, people will be in a repeating cycle in one of these three major groups. It turns out there are subdivisions within each one, but if we can then remove the continuous re-injury and then begin to promote progress through the healing cycle, then pretty soon we're gonna have some cures to diseases that we currently have been taught are incurable. I mean, the, the, the disease that, that motivates so much of our work. We have two. One is 
inborn errors of, of metabolism and mitochondrial disorders, primary respiratory chain disorders. But autism is a disease where we've been fatalistically taught by the medical community, there's, this is a permanent disorder, we cannot fix this, it's a, you know, a neurodevelopmental disorder, and um, I'm sorry, all we can do is treat their child symptomatically. But if you listen to the parents and listen to the children, <laughs> they'll tell you that's not right, okay? There's a, a, hidden, a hidden biology that we haven't tapped into that um, will give us access, that will, will allow pre many children to be able to come off spectrum. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that later. All right, so an important part of this is understanding that there are three different really types of mitochondria. There's their, these are we, their developmental forms or differentiation forms. So the M0 form of mitochondria are adapted for growth and biomass replacement. The M1 mitochondria are pro-inflammatory, needed for defense. And the M2 mitochondria are anti-inflammatory. Okay, so we've talked about each of these. Oh, the other, the other important thing is that when a cell is injured, it releases metabolites from within itself into the extracellular environment. Those metabolites then bind to receptors that are G-protein coupled receptors on neighboring cells and on themselves okay, to send the message that something happened that damaged this cell. <laughs> okay. um, and to begin the, the initial defense um, of, the, of the cell. So those are metabokines. Extracellular ATP is an important to this. We've talked about the blocks. Any purinergic drugs are just one class of, of um, molecules that help to facilitate progress through the healing cycle. Okay, so when we look specifically about mitochondria, I don't know if you can see down here, but they're normal, they normally have a, a filamentous morphology where they're connected in a, in a network, a, a kind of community of, of interdependent, um, metabolically interactive organelles. When they're injured, they will fragment and they'll become more autonomous, less interactive, okay? And you'll see this in ecosystems as well. So rich ecosystems with ample resources will result in um, uh, many species banding together in consortia and, and working together. Um, whereas stressed ecosystems, species will become less and less dependent on each other and more and more um, uh, self, well, more and more independent because they need to be. So right now about 60% of adults um, live with a chronic illness and 30% of children. Um, once healing occurs, um, the mitochondria reconnect again and you reestablish the community, reestablish the network. Okay, so fragmentation, reconnection. All right. So many years ago, we did a little study we call the Mighty Mouse Project. Okay, so the MRL mouse is a mouse with remarkable healing properties. It can, um, for example, it can, when you um, uh, put a little punch through, the, um, through its ear, it will be able to completely heal that in a month. Other mice strains don't do that. Okay. Um, and it wasn't just a simple process because it turned out that um, it was nerve cells were being replaced, muscle cells being replaced, cartilage was being replaced, hair follicles were being replaced, sebaceous glands were being replaced. Every, every tissues from all three primordial germ layers were being um, regenerated in this, in this mouse. So we asked, how does that happen? <laughs> okay. Well, one thing that happens, when you look at the, these are mitochondrial proteins, mitochondrial respiratory chain proteins. If you look both B6 as a control mouse, MRL as the, the, um, the, uh, the healer mouse, they come prepackaged with more mitochondrial, um, 
they have greater mitochondrial reserve capacity. And, you know, so here we can see there's actually, you know, a little bit more mitochondrial protein. But immediately after, so one day after the injury, mitochondrial proteins are specifically downregulated. This is not an accident. This is necessary for healing. Okay? It just has to have an end, and, and there has to be recovery, and we have to know how to turn that back on again at the right times. Okay, so before injury, after injury, and 10 days after, rec after recovery. All right, so in the healthy development, we have wakeful activity and nutrient intake followed by restorative sleep. And we keep going through this cycle normally. As soon as there's excess cell stress or loss, um, we enter into the very first stage of healing, which is containment um, and uh, the inflammatory response. Nate immunity. If there's you know, an excess of metabolic Damaged, some cells will die by apoptosis, others will be consumed by epherocytosis and phagocytosis. Um, once, oh, so, so, so then, then we'll move through um, CDR2. And they can, there can be bypass or um, you know, exit pathways that will result in scarring or senescence, or they can actually be injuries and uh, changes that lead to cancer. But um, this is the cell. Of this is a stage of proliferation, where cells lost in CDR1 are replaced. Mitochondria have to be in a different metabolic state to support this. Okay, and then once the cells are replaced, they're newly born. They're innocent cells. They they really are de-differentiated, and they have to learn from normal neighboring cells what the proper behavior is for, let's say, a renal tubular epithelial cell or you know, a, a, a liver parenchymal cell, or you know, um, you know, a, a muscle cell. Okay. So the CDR with the first injury, ATP is released, and, um, and it gradually decreases with time, and I'll talk about this um, later, because the process of healing will actually metabolize extracellular ATP. So there's a, the analogy of a, a campfire applies. If you have a set amount of fuel, wood that you put on the fire, it will burn until the fuel has been exhausted. Some of the fuel and the inflammatory stimulus in healing is extracellular ATP and, and other metabolites. And those get consumed by the normal influx of neutrophils and um, mononuclear cells um, and in the process of healing. And by, okay, I'll leave it at that. All right. So the metabolism is, you know, starts off in glycolysis and CDR1, aerobic glycolysis, and you know, autonomous oxidative phosphorylation. And by the time you get back to the full health cycle, you have reintegration of brain control to all systems. Okay, so circadian rhythms, circadian changes in, in metabolic patterns, fasting, feeding cycles, activity cycles, all become reintegrated. So a lot of chronic disease pathways result from blocks and, um, let's see, and autism and, and chronic fatigue syndrome typically have blocks toward the differentiation side, just, just be unable to complete the last stages. And there's, so I'll put that, okay. So I talked a little bit about this concept of healing being autocatalytic, that is the release of, of metabolites within the cell become fuel that it actually drives healing and then becomes exhausted over the course of healing. Um, so you've all learned about um, the, say, four stages um, of wound healing, of hemostasis, inflammation, proliferation, and remodeling. These are really different, way, just different ways of saying what I've said in, in the, the healing cycle. Okay. 
And what you can see is extracellular ATP it rapidly increases, but then falls over a period of time after you've cut yourself, okay, let's say. Um, and then by the time you've reached this, you know, two weeks later, AT, extracellular ATP is consumed by the healing cells. Um, and then it, it becomes, healing becomes complete when those intracellular signals of danger have been metabolized. So CDR1 for inflammation, CDR2 for proliferation, CDR3 for um, remodeling, M1 mitochondria, M0, M2. Extracellular ATP is high in CDR1, medium in CDR2, and low in CDR3. Okay. So if wound healing fails, so if you, you, if you persist in relatively high levels of these intracellular metabolites that are normally you know, reduced with completed healing, then what happens is you can't heal. So you go to the initial stages, and then you still, even you know, several weeks later, you still have the, the same state of injury. Okay? All right. So many of you can read about this particular um, this figure in, in the paper on the metabolic features of the healing cycle, I'll just talk about the mitochondrial, that we start in health with a predominance of anti-inflammatory M2 mitochondria. Those are rapidly converted to pro-inflammatory M1 mitochondria that make reactive oxygen. Those naturally decline as um, M0, kind of uncommitted mitochondria, are recruited from neighboring stem cells, actually. Um, so stem cells are brought in with their uncommitted um, mitochondrial contents to grow. That growth occurs and, and declines within this proliferation stage. And then gradually, M2 mitochondria, the anti-inflammatory mitochondria, are restored. So it's not, it's really about what stage of healing you're at that determines, um, you know, how we need to, to, to facilitate things. I won't go through any of these. And for purposes of time, I won't go through this except to point out that M2 mitochondria have a particular morphology. They're typically more filamentous, um, and um, the M1 mitochondria are typically more spherical. In the, in the mitochondriac world, we call this the spaghetti to meatball uh, transformation, okay? Um, but this is normal. This, is, this happens every time you skin your knee or cut yourself or you know, when you have a heart attack or stroke. This is, this is what happens. And then to tie that in with healing, it turns out that when you're 20, 40, 60, 90 years of age, you've accumulated stacks of incomplete cycles of healing that relieve to cells that are left behind, like soldiers that are left behind in different stages that, can't, that haven't completely moved through. And so you will have mosaics of cells left behind in CDR1, CDR2, and CDR3. And in this particular example, I um, showed that this particular person had a genotype and environmental exposure history that, was, um, that predisposed a dysfunctional mosaic of cells accumulating in this proliferative stage that led to um, you know, diabetes and then cancer. Okay? Um, so that's that. You can divide most chronic illnesses up into repeating cycles of one of these three basic um, cell stages of healing. So CDR1 disorders are systemic inflammatory disorders um, uh, and chronic bacterial, fungal, viral infections. CDR2 disorders include diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and leukemia. CDR3 diseases include autism spectrum, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, and then also a number of neurodegenerative disorders, um, uh, neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer and Parkinson. This is a, a preview of the paper that will be coming out next month on, on um, aging. Basically shows that the molecular hallmarks of aging that have been defined naturally fall into repeat problems that are normal, okay, but should be turned off and completed in each one of the three stages of healing. Okay, so 
We age because we can't heal completely. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so this is another thing. So many of you practitioners that have gone into the, you know, kind of the molecular testing world eventually realize that um, for any person that has a disorder, you can identify hundreds of abnormalities. Um, sometimes knowledge of those can help, um, but sometimes they're just part of the process. They just help us know, you know, what stage of, of you know, recovery they're in. Okay, and sometimes, and, and to, it's not, it, so in this world of searching for ways of promoting recovery from injury, um, there are effector molecules that are part of each stage, and then there are regulatory molecules, okay? And I think the, the new pharmacology that we need to go after are, you know, we'll really focus on those regulatory molecules. All right. Let's see. Yeah, I've said a lot of this. Oh, this is another thing that, that will resonate with a lot of you. So um, this happens to be, so we study a dozen different diseases. Um, and uh, one of them happens to be Gulf War illness. Um, we'll have a paper that'll be coming out in two months on that. Uh, but basically, this is the number of vaccines that military personnel received either before deployment in this dotted line or after deployment in the war theater, okay, under the stressful war theater. And it turns out that there is a, you know, basically five to tenfold increase in the chances of coming back with Gulf War illness if you received six of up to 20 different vaccinations that many of these you know, individuals had, okay, um, in the stressful war theater, when they're primed, their, their, their CDR is already primed, okay? So the context of injury matters. So in chronic fatigue syndrome, we can have molds, HHV6, EBV, Lyme, trypanosomes, trauma, all contributing to this, you know, to patients finding themselves lost in a dark forest, okay, um, in this repeating cycle that we call chronic fatigue syndrome. And the important thing to continually note is that, so I've called this dour, and it'll be a topic for another conversation, but um, the important thing to note is that, again, the path to recovery does not retrace these steps. Obviously, if they're still mold exposures, you have to deal with that. But a lot of times we're misled by the immune system that because it's been primed to remember past exposure, sometimes it will spontaneously react um, even in the absence of you know, a physical um, reminder. Um, so, so pathogenesis, is how you generate pathology. Salogenesis is how you generate recovery. All right. When we draw blood, we think of it as drawing a sample of, uh, uh, from a, an ocean or a forest ecosystem, so where it's a, a river ecosystem um, that has all the nutrients and all the waste products of all the cells in the body, both bacterial and human. Um, we take that microcosm, put it through a half million dollar machine, and generate a metabolomic signature. Um, just to briefly go through this, we'll take the blood, separate the molecules, weigh them, identify them chemically, use statistics to inform us about what molecules are important, Okay, and which ones aren't, and then try to map that back to our knowledge of um, biochemical pathways, that, that, that famous wall chart of biochemistry that, that's um, is hard, to, hard to grasp. All right. So when we did that in autism um, and did receiver operator um, curve analysis, we had about an 88% diagnostic accuracy in PTSD, about 86, 91% in Gulf War. Um, uh, Oh, it turns out it's 
very simple, just from blood, not paying attention to steroid hormones, but looking at fatty acids and amino acids to tell whether that blood came from a male or a female. <laughs> okay, there, you know, it's, there are very significant differences between males and females in the chemistry that is maintained and what we associate with health. So there's no such thing as a, an average human Okay, all right, we're not a halfway between a male and a female. We are a male or a female. And that changes, and the chemistry of health changes with development. So what's healthy for a 25-year-old is not the same as what's healthy for a 55-year-old. All right. Okay, so we've looked at autism, chronic fatigue syndrome, Gulf War, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, major depressive disorder with suicidal ideation, a, an autoimmune disease called primary sclerosis and cholangitis. It's a major cause of childhood liver failure leading to transplant, exercise and aging, and dour and worms. This uh, persistent state that it, it's a biological way of suspending biological aging for a period of time um, uh, under stressful environmental conditions and then being able to come back and re-enter re normal, uh, normal life cycle after the environment has, has been, has improved. <laughs> and what we did, you know, when we look at a Venn diagram of the metabolites, the specific, so we measure about this, they call it roughly 500 different metabolites, um, chemi natural chemicals in the blood, um, and put those in a Venn diagram, there are metabolites that are unique for each one of these, so that's the, the petals of the flower, of the sunflower. But then there are, there are pathways that are consistently and universally used in every one of these disorders, okay? And that's, those are the pathways that regulate the cell danger response. Um, for lack of time, I'm going to uh, pass up a little bit of this. Um, I'll point out that when we compare Gulf War and illness and chronic fatigue syndrome, we have many overlapping pathways, but interestingly, some of the overlapping pathways are used in different directions. So things that were elevated in Gulf War illness are actually low in chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay. And to, some of the names I'll just mention because they'll come back at you. You'll hear them over and over again because they are absolutely fundamental. So ceramides, sphingomyelins, glycosphingolipids, ph phospholipids, sterols, amino acids, and purines. So th these are all things, well, Sam and Sal, you already know about. But these are, these are things that are fundamental for cellular health and, and regulating it. And it's not enough. Well, okay. I'll leave it at that. All right. Um, let's see if I wanted to do anything more. Um, okay, so everybody's familiar with, you know, um, dopamine binding to dopaminergic receptors, serotonin binding to serotonergic receptors, acetylcholine binding to uh, cholinergic receptors. Those are all membrane receptors that bind to metabolites. Those metabolites happen to be neurotransmitters, um, but that's kind of a chauvinistic way of thinking about metabolism, okay? So, so uh, there, there's a much more nuanced picture of metabolism and metabokines binding to receptors to, to establish resilience, health, and disease than just neurotransmitters, okay? Um, so ATP binds to purinergic receptors. Oh, this is a fun slide. Okay, so. This is not just restricted to animal cells. This is some, so the cell danger response is something that plants do, okay? So, um, so this is where a, a cricket took a bite out of um, a, a little mustard plant called Arabidopsis, okay? And it turns out if you then add either glutamate or ATP, but the glutamate and ATP are both very, very high concentration within a cell, so when they're just, when they're, released to the extracellular environment, it's a danger signal, okay? Um, and this is what happens uh, when you add a danger signal to a bite. So all the cells will begin to, to they will respond to their neighbor, neighbor's signal and release um, calcium. So this signal actually is fluorescence in the response to, um, to calcium release, 
Okay? And that's fundamental for the cell danger response. So I'll, I'll just, for kicks, let's see. Uh, I guess that's, we'll go through it one more time. Okay. Okay, I'm being told to wrap up. So um, I'll try to do that. So again, we, so we talked about a plant where you added ATP in glutamate. Turns out that, neuro, that, that, that synapses will, if you have a glutamatergic synapse, um, ATP is a co-neurotransmitter at every single synapse discovered to date. Okay, and it, it re it's a neuromodulator. It regulates the postsynaptic neuronal response to glutamate and serotonin and acetylcholine and dopamine, okay? So you can imagine from an evolutionary point of view, it was very important for all of our ancestors to remember exactly everything that they did when they were running away from the tiger, okay? Your memory had to be intensified. How do you intensify that without making new synapses because you can't do that in a matter of seconds that you're running away you modulate the information by resulting in increased amount of atp released with the glutamate okay In the paper on the healing cycle, I've identified over a hundred different G protein coupled receptors that are all related um, to ultimately to our ability to smell the world and to, to see color, to sense the outside world, okay? Um, gives our cells the ability to respond to local chemical changes. And whether that's in, so each, each step of the way involves metabolites that will bind, uh, that are, act as endocannabinoids or leukotrienes, lysophospholipids, uh, viral co-receptors. It turns out that sucrose has its own receptor. <laughs> um, um, neuropeptides and chemokines. Okay, I won't belabor this except to say that mitochondria are talking to the nucleus, nucleus are talking to mitochondria, um, and there are literally thousands of, of channels in the membrane that will open under uh, reactive oxygen stress, and also turns out because of biophysical changes in the composition of the, the lipids in the membrane. So many of you have heard of lipid rafts, and it turns out cholesterol and single lipids are uh, co-localized to these um, detergent-resistant patches, um, on nano, nano terrains on the, on the cell membrane, and th those support these, um, these channels. And so a stress cell will release more ATP and more glutamate, okay? Um, and you can imagine if more so ATP is being released, then there's less ATP in the cell, okay? So you need that for recovery and growth, but if it's being released, the cell has to work harder, okay? Um, so I went looking for any drug in the world that might block that initial release and bind to, to um, cell surface receptors that respond to that release, and there was one, and it was Suramin. And so, looked at over 2,000 drugs. Um, turns out it's one of the older man-made drugs um, on the planet, synthesized in 1916. It's still on the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines for the treatment of African sleeping sickness. Um, but I wanna remind everybody that our work is not about a single drug, it's about a concept that we'll, you could call molecular armistice therapy. So um, Nelson Mandela once said, when we are done, when, we are, when a deep injury is, when we experience a deep injury, we cannot heal until we forgive, okay? So we have to somehow give the signal that the war is over, <laughs> okay? You know, at the right time, I mean, you have to create an environment that really, you know, is also uh, not hypocritical, you know, that where, the, you know, the, war, the, the environment is also healthy. But anyway, so a ATP looks like that. This is what sermon looks like. And I'm gonna finish with a brief run through 
I'm going to, of the, the trial results. So we had 20 individuals, um, males 5 to 17, 16, um, met eligibility requirements. We were able to identify 10 that could be matched by ADOS severity, autism severity, um, age, and IQ. Randomly assigned to, um, to treatment one or treatment two. And in the process, this is what we saw. So these are the 10 pioneers, children 11, 5, 14, 6, and 7 years of age, all with autism. Um, we had four that were, um, had very severe oromotor dyspraxia, um, were nonverbal. Um, within a day, um, one child started saying, you know, he looked up at his mom and said, I finished my dinner. That was his, his longest sentence. Um, this is a child who started out with more um, language. His mom had asked, I would like to be able to talk to my child about his day at school. I've never been able to do that. Okay. And he came home in the, uh, within the first week and said, I learned to play tag with the kids at school today. Um, this young man was nonverbal, um, but began practicing making new sounds, um, singing and actually dancing you know, at home, um, uh, taking up new interests. And about a week after his father was making a sandwich one Saturday afternoon in the, in the um, kitchen, and his first sentence as a 14-year-old was, I want to eat chips. <laughs> okay, little boy, I want to have a drink. Today I want to say hi to the crossing guard lady. There are many more stories. When we broke the code, half of them received sermon, and the, ha the other half had received placebo, and there were no changes in those. I won't go through all this. I will go through to say that um, just with five kids, we were startled to actually find that the ADOS scores were statistically significant, both by parametric and non-parametric analysis. Um, and that did not happen in any of the placebos. Same thing for atypical behavior checklists and other measures. I won't go through all this. So after one dose, children... Um, Went, so autism spectrum is defined as an ADOS score of 7 to 10 in this gray zone. So the average child went from 8.6 to an average of 7. So you know, we're hoping that if, they, if things continued, um, they would be able to drop down below the threshold of 7 for autism spectrum disorder. Um, and there were no statistically significant changes in the placebo group. All right, so the lesson was that if you used Suramin at a low dose, this 5 to 15 micromolar, um, it was safe. And each of the children that received it had improved language, improved social interaction, decreased stims, restricted interests, and de decreased OCD behavior. But in addition to that, so there were other improvements. So things like the response to all their other physical and occupational and speech therapies, their education, the teachers, although did not know that they were part of a clinical trial, began sending letters home and talking, some actually phoning up the moms, you know, and, and saying, you know, what's going on? You know, uh, this child has just completed uh, three years of, of, sc of schoolwork in three weeks. Decreased anxiety and meltdowns over novel situations, so more resilience in general. Um, improved sleep, so, so more solid, non-disrupted sleep. Interest in new foods. Um, kids asking for something green for the first time or, you know, um, or other things. So, and GI function, I'll talk, you know, so... We actually have data on this in mice that um, when you treat the animals, their gut microbiome normalized, okay? So when you address a root problem, all the other symptoms also fall into line without you having to specifically address, you know, so methylation, uh, B12 metabolism, um, it's, so, so you're, you can, well, microbiome, the, the, all those things help, but they also naturally fall into line 
again, when you deal with the root problem. All right. So is Sermon safe and effective for treatment of all kinds of autism? Can Sermon help some children come off ASD spectrum? And what about ME-CFS? So human impact, priceless. And thank you very much. I think in the interest of fasting, uh, that we, 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 we might make the, the break a little shorter because I think when we have someone of this, of this uh, experience and knowledge and stature coming to Australia, I think we probably still have some questions. We will get more questions later. So we probably will have to shorten the breaks. Um, I've got a question first and then we'll go over here. Um, I work a lot with chronic fatigue and see most a lot of patients with chronic fatigue have... Uh, like autism, they have hypersensitivities, light, sound, etc. as is seen in autism, complex regional pain syndrome, post-injury, and the, the amplifier appears turned up. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if this cell cycle being locked with the ATP being extracellular and glutamate, making that neuromodulation more sort of uh, sensitive, it, could that potentially be a factor in the reason there is these sensitivities in chronic fatigue, complex regional pain syndrome, and also the calcium side of things and how that right might relate to calcium channelopathy and autism, which is also in the Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so, so we have children now um, with autism that have been, have moved through teenage years and who have developed um, dense chronic fatigue syndrome that has incapacitated them. And then we have also adults um, who have developed chronic fatigue syndrome, but then um, develop uh, it, complete mutism and um, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, uh, we and and so we've this these observations and our and the lab work have led us to the conclusion that actually autism and chronic fatigue syndrome are two disorders on the same spectrum connected by the chronic you know by the cell danger response and that they're just happening at different times in in life. Um, and, and so directly related to the question on, let's say, complex regional pain syndrome. So a big part of that, I believe, is purinergic signaling. So it turns out uh, P2X7 is a, you know, a, a G, a, an ionotropic you know, um, uh, receptor that uh, is gated by ATP involved in chronic pain syndrome. And there's some work trying to develop new antipurinergics to treat chron chronic pain syndrome and complex regional pain syndrome um, with antipurinergic drugs. Okay. So virtually yes to every one of your insights, okay. Bob, thank you very much for coming all this way. I'm very grateful. Sure. Your presentation has been amazing. Um, my burning question is I understand that the children in the study um, did lose their gains off the suramen. Sure. If they had had their toxins removed and their, their cell danger triggers or stressors addressed prior to the ceremon, do you suspect that the benefits may have been maintained? Not with one dose, um, but there's never been a chronic illness um, that's been cured with a single dose of drug, okay? So, so um, I do believe that in principle that's correct, okay? So in principle, somewhere between six months and 12 months, children will become well, it would be unnecessary to, to continue, you know, uh, let's say, ceramin treatment or some, you know, eventually there'll be new um, antipyrinergic drugs. Um, but uh, removing triggers and, and uh, supporting resilience with good diet and, and really, really everything that the community is already doing, okay, um, it helps set the stage for healing, okay? It's just there's an activation energy that, that the kids just can't get past with you know one extra tool, okay, or you know hopefully, eventually a shelf full of extra tools, but we'll only have to use them like casts, where they 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 support recovery for a period of time, and then the children will activate, be able to engage in the most powerful neurodevelopmental force in the universe, which is natural child play, okay, and 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 then then it'll become self-sustaining, and maybe they'll be. At risk, so I believe, for example, on the adult side of things, when you know we, so if you're a diabetic that has cured your diabetes from with diet and exercise, you will be a recovering diabetic for life, 
Okay, you'll always be at, at risk for going back. I believe that may be the case. We don't know um, with autism and chronic fatigue syndrome that there'll be a, a risk of drifting back to the patterns, okay? But once we have the tools, it might be just a tune-up. And they just go on to, you know, college and law school and marriage and, you know, I mean, it, it could be a completely different world than the one we're experiencing right now. <laughs> yeah, one, yeah, the one, one with a heart. You mean? Yeah. So. <laughs> um, the questions you can, can you read the questions down there? Oh, yeah, I can so. Them, so the question is, um, do we know of any natural compounds that have a similar effect to Lodo Sermon? That's an excellent question. Yeah, that's an excellent question. We've done a lot of work on this. Um, you know, and the reason I, I hesitate to to put people um, on the, so yes, there are okay, but they don't work. Um, it's anywhere near the effectiveness of ceremon, okay, and not, and also there's some heterogeneity in the effects. So, and I don't really want to. Um, uh, well, just for purposes of an example, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that kudzu root, okay, kudzu, um, has a P2X7, you know, antagonist in it, okay. That in kudzu is been used in traditional Chinese medicine for a long time, okay. But P2X7 is not enough to cure autism. <laughs> okay, I mean, I just say that. It turns out by dumb luck, Suramin was an inhibitor by several different mechanisms of each of the 19 different purinergic receptors that have been cloned. <laughs> okay, so it's a broad based, you know, antagonist of purinergic signaling. We don't even know which sub types of which subtypes of receptors are absolutely necessary or important for autism versus chronic fatigue syndrome versus PTSD versus let's say you know um, opiate addiction um, there'll be lots of other you know applications to all this um, uh, but I'll give you that example but I'm hoping there'll be a drug renaissance of you know that will eventually Explore the rainforest and 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 ocean ecosystems, looking for um, metabokines. Well, salogens, okay, metabokines. You know that promote um, progress through the healing cycle. Okay. Um, oh, could you please define pure energic? Okay, so pure energic just means for purines. So like glutamatergic. Um, is a neurotransmitter receptor system that responds to glutamate. Purinergic is a neurotransmitter and, and you know, metabolic receptor system that responds to purines, which are adenosine nucleotides and guanosine nucleotides and inosine nucleotides. But the ones that are most active extracellularly are the adenine nucleotides. Okay? But also, it turns out UDP and UTP, so pyrimidines, um, are grouped into purinergic signaling, um, and they, they have their own receptors. Okay, um, let's see. I'll take maybe one more. So here, is there a way to get results naturally with ATP regulation instead of uh, using Suramin? I'm sure once we get smarter about this, yes. <laughs> Okay. And, and actually, I think that many of the therapies that, that are already being applied um, are helping to lower the extracellular ATP signaling um, and, and get the kids closer to being able to make that final step to health. Um, it, it's just um, there's, there's nothing that's been 100% effective yet. Okay. Um, so, yeah? Well, maybe I would go to another one. Yeah. So, with the ATP, is it, is it possible that it's just um, a reaction to a situation? So you're removing the ATP by the blocking, but the situation is still there. So will yeah. that not then yeah. generate the ATP again? Yeah, so there are three steps in the treatment of chronic illness. One is step one, remove the triggers, which are really always a perfect storm of triggers for an individual child or adult. It's never one thing. Okay, it's always a, a collection of, you know, toxic exposures, nutritional gaps, uh, traumatic experiences. There are just many, many factors, you know, so infection, in utero infections, lots of different things. Um, so uh, that's one, remove the triggers. Number two, 
fill in, fill in the nutritional and, and supplement gaps. So that creates a, the, the foundation for readiness. Okay? And then two or well, three is use a, um, well, so one, apply a drug that will promote healing. Okay? And so and, and progress through healing. And, and that would be Suramen for one, but there'll be many more. Um, and the, what we know from our animal work is that we can give a, a pregnant mouse an injection um, of double-strand RNA to simulate a viral in infection that gives a 24-hour like flu illness okay, at a specific time. But the mom is completely normal you know, um, the next day. And she, but her pups have social abnormalities and learning disabilities and activated microglia in their brains for life. For life. So that's a case where I know with 100% certainty that the trigger's gone, but the animals still have a chronic illness. And what's more is when we treat with Suramen, they completely correct their social abnormalities and their, and their learning disabilities, although we can't resurrect Purkinje cells. Okay, that's a, another fact. But so, so there are cases, and it will be, you know, for you in the community to, you know, um, define this more objectively, but there are many cases where the triggers are remote and no longer present. The that triggers. It sounds like a homeopathic situation where it reacts against the memory of the actual invader rather than the actual invader. Well, no, it's okay. So, how does it, like when you're, okay, so in American baseball, if a, if a batter sees the first fastball, he can better anticipate that the next fastball, okay? Our metabolism does the same thing, okay? It anticipates based on experience, not, it doesn't make things up, okay? It, it bases its future response to past experiences, okay? And that's what is causing the autism-like social and learning disabilities in the, in the mice and and based on what the, the recovery, the, just very dramatic. I mean, remember, this is one dose of a drug that only has a, it has a two-week half-life. So it does you know, eventually, so after eight weeks, all the children had gone back to their pre-treatment baselines. Okay? But the fact that they responded so dramatically means that there's a big part of their illness that wasn't the result of persistent triggers triggering influences. Not to say that those weren't an influence, and I, I do believe that if we get better at taking care of those, we'll improve outcomes also. But that's an important thing. It's so, so it's, you know, you, we have to be objective about whether the triggers still exist or not. So something inside of the cell stimulates the ATP because of the cell danger response? It's a memory, it's no, it's a memory, it's, it's actually a structural change in the organization of the cytoskeleton mitochondria that create a spatial, like a geometric memory. Okay, so the structure of the way that membranes are packed together creates a capacity to respond to in, environmental chemical changes that's different than the cell that had the packing of those membranes and cytoskeletal elements that were different, okay? So the, literally the structure of the cell determines how rapidly it can respond to environmental changes. In the interest of, uh, of, of we could ask questions all day with such a wealth of knowledge, it's absolutely you know, an honor to have you here. Uh, so first of all, if I could ask everyone to, to have a huge round of applause. So, so, some Australian organic resveratrol. <laughs> but uh, so we've only got 15 minutes, uh, so for those who are not keto adaptive, uh, get some food into you. <laughs>